we're communicating to our business community what our capital needs are and how we plan to address them. And finally, it serves as a financial document. Once this is vetted, it's approved by council, we're then going to pass it and we're gonna roll it into our budget discussions. So at budget time, we'll be talking a little bit more about operational costs, having already vetted a lot of these projects. There's three main categories, as you're probably familiar with. There's the transportation, environment, and capital assets. On each of those three categories, there's that $50,000 minimum threshold. So if it doesn't reach that $50,000, you're not gonna see it in this document. We can talk about it come budget discussion time with the exception of IT and fleet. IT didn't have one and fleet has a 5,000 uh, threshold. Because communities have a lot of various needs, we need to be able to leverage various resources. IP, these are some of the resources that we are discussing. We're talking about our sales tax for our water and sewer systems. We're talking about various federal and state grant and loan programs. Our TTF, which we just passed uh, in August of 2015. Our motor fuel tax administered by the state. Our parks and stormwater sales tax, which is um, coming up in September 30th, 2018. Our fire sales tax, which we uh, luckily passed in 2014. Our enterprise funds, which are operate a little bit more like business funds. That's water, sewer, solid waste. And our casino agreement. A majority of the tax initiatives that we have that help support our capital improvement program are finite, meaning they have a sunset. So we have to be cognizant of those dates. The most pending right now, and the council has already engaged in discussion, is our parks, recreation, and stormwater tax. That expires in September of 2018. We need to be able to help educate citizens, educate ourselves of all our needs out there, and really vet for renewing that initiative. It's gonna be a busy three years. Right after our parks and um, stormwater tax, we have our sewer tax, our capital improvement sales tax for our sewer system in 2019. And then TTF again rolls back in 2020. So it's gonna be a busy three years. We're gonna to have to do a lot of communication over these next three years. Now onto some fun stuff. Here are some pictures that Stan Polovic, I'm sure would be very familiar with. I don't think he got any sleep those three days back in August when this project was going on. We, we um, again, this is our flood wall tow drain project. We removed 600 feet of pipe and we moved a railroad track out of the flood wall area. Very intensive three days, awesome time-lapse video that we have, we shared it with council. Great project. Our LaSalle tank, if you didn't get out there to see it while they were constructing it, props to our PIO people for getting such great pictures. This really shows you the magnitude of what a 1 million gallon tank looks like this year. And here's some projects that are probably more visible to our community. We had our neighborhood street repair program. This was the repurposing of the Armstrong funds from TTF3. We had a little over $3 million to work with. This year we invested a little over a million and a half into our neighborhood streets. Lexington Place, Nashland Hills received a large benefit from those projects. We also had our Sprig Street sidewalk gap project completed this year. When I first moved here, I drove down this road a lot and I cringed when I saw people walking in the streets or walking in the grass on rainy days covered in mud. There was a lot of foot traffic on that road. They were either heading to cast or class or heading to that convenience store now being able to take advantage of that sidewalk that's been installed is just a great asset. And a few others, our investment in Kappa Hall Fields, the synthetic turf, the new outfield fence, and the new digital scoreboard. Our um, riverfront pedestrian bridge, I have to point out two darling kids in the bottom left there, and my son staring at them, wondering why they get to hold the ribbon and he doesn't. <laughs> But that was, that was completed this year, and that connected our Red Star area to our Riverwalk and the casino area. Gordonville Roundabout just completed. Where I've received a lot of great feedback from the completion of that project. I drive that way every day. It is night and day difference going through that intersection. And then our Gordonville tank demolition. They actually took piece by piece apart that tank. I hadn't been a part of a tank demo 
So as soon as I saw that project in the books, I went to our contractor's website to see how they might approach it. And they had a video on their very homepage and they were taking down a lower volume tank that had the ball on the top and they used explosives at the base and they toppled it and I watched it and I was so excited. I was, this is gonna be great. And then I read underneath, it had a little disclaimer. It said, most tank demolitions do not involve explosives. This was a unique project. But they did a good job on that one. We're also looking to evolve this document. Again, this is a communication document. We want people to be, to be able to look at this, read it, understand it, and take as much as they can from it. So some input that we received this year was, these maps don't do much for us. It's dashes and dots on a city map with colors on it that really doesn't communicate much. So we're, we've enumerated them this year and added a legend in the documents. It's not on these slides, but it should be in your documents. That way you can understand which projects we're talking about, which dash, which dot means what. So hopefully that's helpful this year. That was transportation. This is environment, quite a few environment projects programmed this year. And this is a look at our five-year program as a whole. You see two columns there, one's program, one's contingent. So program, we've identified uh, almost $81 million of projects over the next five years that do have a funding source. Contingent meaning we have no funding source, but it's a project we see needing to be completed. We're at about 184 million. That number can be somewhat inflated because there's some projects in there. If funded, other projects would go away. An example would be City Hall. City Hall's in there and then investments into this building and, and a new HVAC system, which would be almost a million dollars. Obviously, if we went one way or the other, one wouldn't need to be funded. Just something to be mindful of. So if you're a pie, uh, pie graph person, here's a pie graph. You can see facilities is still a pretty good chunk of our CIP. We still have our police station on the books, our fire station renovations, as well as our new fire station four. Overall, uh, there wasn't much change this year. We kind of built off what we thought the council approved last year. We built off from the assumptions that everything, <laughs> you were okay with everything that we had last year, so we moved all that forward. We then asked departments for new submittals and or uh, submissions of projects that had been completed. So we've, uh, when I say we, I mean Beth Little in our office did a great job going to each department, compiling all of the projects and creating the document that you have in front of you. Here's a quick look at a uh, program by project type. Our TTF-5, again, passed in August 2015. We had a new focus with our TTF program. Before we did a lot of new construction, we were very heavy on new construction with our TTF initiative. We only proposed one new road that was Fountain Street connecting it to Independence. The rest was a lot of maintenance. So only new road you'll see in TTF-5 that was proposed was for Fountain Street. Again, we're continuing our momentum with our neighborhood streets. That was the repurposed TTF3 funds. We again look to invest another million and a half into neighborhood street repairs. Our asphalt overlay program, we're proposing $1.4 million this year in asphalt overlay funding, and then $700,000 in the subsequent years through the life of TTF5. A look at some of the specific programs. We have our Sloan Creek Bridge for fiscal year 17, 18. That's the raising of that structure. We also have Lexington. That's from Sherwood to Cape Rock. We also have West End. That would be from Rose to New Madrid widening. And then from New Madrid to Bertling, that would be a reconstruction. We have Independence in fiscal year 17, 18. That would be a study we would have conducted to lessen the congestion from Gordonville to Carruthers. So given the recommendations of that study, we would like to be able to implement them. We've budgeted about 3.5 million for the study and implementing those recommendations. Um, Sprig Street, that would be from William to, William to Broadway. And then Main Street, that would be from Roberts to Cape Rock. And then finally, Fountain Street being our only new street in TTF5. Environment, a lot, 
pretty much a majority of the projects you're going to see in environment are, are taken directly from assessments that we've done or master plans that we've adopted. So we're following their recommendations, following their scheduling, and that's what you see here in our recommendations. First off, in wastewater, we have our riverfront force main repairs, phase one. Then we have our several Dalhousie pump stations replacement program, and um, that's going to be phased over three years. That's actually six lift stations out there. In water, our LaSalle booster pump station, that's under contract right now our Gordonville tank demo and construction, and our plant one filters rehab and re-rating. IT, generally right now we're in good shape. We have a major undertaking right now. That is our radio interoperability programmed over the next three years starting this year. That is a significant undertaking for any community of any size. I know both of our chiefs would be quick to vet how vital it is that they are able to seamlessly communicate not only amongst themselves, but all the other agencies in our region. Highly vital. Hats off to our deputy city manager for championing it. Um, that's something that we're proposing this year. GPS tracking on our city trash and recycling trucks. That would be not only efficiency for solid, op uh, solid waste operations, but we would see efficiencies in other departments too. Because as they canvass the city, which they do every week, they would be able to report other issues outside of their department to other departments in the city. They could do it in real time with uh, GPS location and I believe even pictures too of the issues. This year we identified three projects we thought were excellent candidates for the innovation fund. The first being our digital plan review. I can tell you speaking with our development community, this is something that they would love the city to be able to have is digital plan review. Right now we operate on hard copies. It's, it's not efficient. We have to um, collect our copies in silos, aggregate them, have meetings all the time just to review what each person needs as far as um, deficiencies they've found in plans. We have to store the copies on site. So just not a best management practice. So what we're recommending is converting to a digital plan review. We'd also like to update our aerials for GIS. Our best aerials we have right now are from 2006. So decade old pictures in the development world isn't overly helpful. We're having to do a lot of field verification in our GIS. And then police body cameras. We're proposing 50 body cameras, uh, which would also cover three years of maintenance. That was about $54,000. I'd let Chief vet that. I can share with you that in my previous community, was under the opinion that these eventually would become a mandate and that his staff should become familiar with the technology before they were required to. So it's a hard time to be a police officer. And my experience is that the department Yeah, I think that uh, they're nothing but a benefit for the department for, for a couple of reasons. One, um, for the evidentiary purpose, you've got the camera on you, you're collecting evidence real time, uh, whether it's a, a DWI arrest or something like that. Um, and the other is everybody just behaves better when there's a camera around. Um, and that that's not just the, the citizen that they're in contact with, but the officers are going to behave better. Not that our officers behave poorly now, but there's always that incentive for everybody to be on their on their toes when when the camera is there. Um, one of the things that we're really encouraged by was the legislator last year cleaned up a lot of the language that would have made it difficult for somebody just to get see the police over at their neighbor's house and decide, hey, I would like video of the inside of their house or I would like to know what their little marital spat was about. I'll go down and get a copy of that video. Legislators clean that that language up, which makes us far more comfortable with deploying cameras on the street. And that was, that was a real concern with us, but in, in the last legislative session, they, they cleaned a lot of that language up and you pretty much have to have standing in the case um, or there's gotta be a really, a, a reason for it to be in the public interest for that video to, to be released. They also defined um, the record keeping of that, which also made uh, it a lot 
more uh, affordable as far as the amount of storage that we had to have. And so that was uh, combine all those things together really is time. And, uh, and I really applaud uh, Chief and our IT for really looking for that right time because um, we've saved a lot of money by, by waiting a little bit and not being the first people out there, but, um, and, and then we got protections that were really necessary as well, so. Thank you. Uh, next facilities, uh, our indoor sports complex is still on the books. We're asking for 200,000 for equipment, extra security, some landscaping. Our police station, again, still on the books, and our fire stations, our fire station replacement, and our two renovations. And finally, the um, city hall, the elephant in the room, or the, the room in the elephant, or <laughs> I'm not sure how that analogy works, but the building that we're in uh, remains a major unfunded need. Again, it's an 80-year-old building with uh, HVAC system that continually is failing, and we are having a lot of difficulties finding replacement parts for. So takeaways, again, our tax initiatives are critical to our capital improvement program. Without these tax initiatives, that contingency column that you saw would skyrocket. But thankfully in 2014, our fire tax passed. In 2015, our transportation trust fund five passed, but there's still work to be done. 18, 19, 20, and 18, we have our PRS2. In 2019, it's our capital improvement sales tax for our sewer, that's that quarter percent. And then in 2020, our TTF-6 will be up. And again, City Hall remains a major unmet need. Next, next steps. Right now, we're at the stage where we're looking for feedback from council. I did not make the assumption that when you received your books on Friday, you spent the weekend scouring them, ignoring your families, and come, came here with a huge comprehensive list of absolutely everything you want in here right now. So we get, we're giving you time to be able to reflect on this, get with us. We'll take initial feedback. That's not the point of tonight. But um, we are looking to hold our first public hearing on February 20th, and we hope to adopt it the first meeting of March. Then again, once it's adopted, we will roll this. That after it was approved by council, we'll roll it into our budget discussions where we'll talk more about operational costs. So this is the part where I turn it to you. Um, are you happy with our assumptions? Have you found projects you want in here? And how much time would you like? The co plan review. That yeah. is program that is funded, is that correct? It's proposed. Okay. I think it's imperative that it do be funded, uh, especially with the lack of staff resources and that. It's an efficiency maker for sure. Um, I saw some capital assets regarding um, stormwater, assuming it's to maintain detention basins. Have we gotten anywhere with the cost on maintaining detention basins? We don't maintain. Could you repeat it? Have we gotten anywhere on determining costs of maintaining detention basins? We do not. Currently we we did meet last week. We do have some numbers. I don't think we're quite ready to share the numbers yet, but we're we're aware of them. Yeah, we're we're collecting them. Council, we'll be we'll coming back. Sure we keep it a secret until our guests. We'll be coming back to you in the next few weeks with an update on the as a follow up to the stormwater special study session that we had in December. Staff has been researching a lot of the information that council requested, including, for example, the detention base and maintenance cost. And so we're compiling all of that and we'll be coming back to you in a few weeks to report back. Thank you. If I could add one piece. I, in my ward, I mostly hear about street repair. And so I would like to um, make sure that that we're putting enough money towards street repair. I know TTF had five passed, but um, I'd like to see us maybe keep up what we're doing. I, one project in particular, Molly, not to sound like a broken <clears throat> record, is uh, Lexington from Rampart to Carrier. And that, that piece is, uh, I feel like we're, we're addressing it, but I feel like we're 
maybe putting band-aids on. That was the section that we had. We we'd had a lot of discussion about that during uh, when we came up with the pro the uh, projects for TTF five, and um, I think actually there was there was more on Lexington, but to try to cover all the bases that they wanted to cover with TTF five, uh, they looked uh, council asked us to look at uh, at more of a band aid <laughs> approach, quite frankly, and uh, so that's what we did, and uh, and 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 it was it's a hard decision. You, You'd like to treat everything uh, to the fullest extent that you need to, but in order to get across uh, miles and miles of roads, roads and streets that we have, um, that's that was a decision at that time anyway. The only other piece that I would add is that continually um, try to figure out what we or look at all the avenues for City Hall. I saw in you know contingent. I would hate to start. Uh, putting a bunch of money in, into um, an 80 year old facility. Uh, you see potential elevator, and granted, these are in contingent, but I would hate for us to, to throw, but you know, throw any more money into this facility, quite frankly. Absolutely, and that's the reason why we haven't. And uh, that's, you know, but it does continue to deteriorate, though. And so it's, um, we piece together. Um, hot and cold water pipes and those types of things and have had a few leaks this year that uh, that are kind of messy to deal with but um, that 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 is our strategy well I w it's not that it's an 80 year old building it's is the building <laughs> currently able to facilitate the services that it needs to provide and provide adequate workspaces and so it's not the age of the building there are ways you could reconfigure yeah. this particular facility but then we'd be in the same situation where the police station where we considered can we reconfigure what we have now while simultaneously building it for the new and that's really a struggle so it's not the age of the building but it's definitely what you can do with it and the you know capacity I mean, yeah but I would say that that the um, I've got four or five questions that I can give you all at once if that would be easier um, well if you don't mind Wayne yeah. before we leave City Hall um, can someone talk about the changes that will be occurring once the police station opens? The changes that will be occurring at City Hall. So will there be increased spaces that are now available? Um, yes, the uh, the spaces that will be available will be primarily will be here and the offices outside which contain the court, the court uh, thing. We um, have done some preliminary work looking at how we might be able to use those spaces We've talked about moving uh, human resources there in order to give them more um, the, some more private spaces um, and then uh, with the space that they vacate um, working in with the city manager's office and then bringing public affairs in that space so that they would be more accessible as well and then that would open up a little bit more space there but it, it it doesn't open up a lot of office space because it's just that little bit out there uh, from the police station and then of course this becomes uh, available those additional days on Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, okay. that's what we looked at okay um, I've, I've certainly appreciate the uh, the indexing you provided on the map and mm -hmm. and appreciate you accommodating my suggestion along those lines it makes it much more helpful um, so I would ask, why don't we have a threshold for IT? And I looked at the numbers, and it seems to be most of their stuff is above the 50,000. Um, so that might be a question to ask. And more generally, it doesn't seem to me that there is a consistent um, uh, approach across departments. So for example, and, and you know, I understand there's going to be additional stormwater ones added in later, but it seems as if there are long lists for some departments and very short lists for others. And some, it seems as if it's a wish list of everything that they could think of, and others, it seems to have already been vetted carefully to only have a few things on it. And so I'd like to see in the future, to what, you know, what is that process? What, what questions do departments ask? What does the city manager's office do to help facilitate those decisions to, so that there is consistency across departments? And, and maybe there already is, but it seems to me there are projects we've discussed that I don't see here, and others I've never heard of before that RIC on this list. And that doesn't mean that has to be that way, just I'm curious because it does look like kind of a, a 
a variety of different approaches. And the same thing with the definitions and descriptions. Some of them are very detailed, some of them are redundant of the title, and so it would make sense to me that you have a consistent explanation for what the description should do. And it may be that some can be blank because there's no reason to explain what a police car is. I, I think we know the purpose of that. Um, maybe that's not the best example, but just more consistency from department to department across the CAP. Uh, I will say this is a much better document than what I saw three years ago when it was four times as big and, and half as useful. So this is definitely a proven, and I, I appreciate everything that's, that's happened along those lines. Print was probably bigger. Uh, print <laughs> is small, or maybe we're just getting older. Um, well, uh, I, uh, if I could, uh, Councilman Bowen, I'd like to, to talk uh, a little bit about the consistency approach. Um, and, and you're right. One thing that, um, that Molly and Alex uh, have discussed is next year is having a vetting uh, with each department uh, head and, and going through that. So I think that will help uh, to a large degree. But then there is there are going to be some things where it isn't consistent. For instance, this year um, I asked uh, public, uh, uh, public works with uh, stormwater. Of course, some of that hadn't come along yet. Uh, but uh, and, and parks and, and rec to to really look at PRS and begin to put things in the contingent that are coming on. So, so those long lists are, are because of that and because we're getting ready for that. Um, and, and then I think because we haven't, uh, didn't meet with each department that way, then I think that's the inconsistency, which we're gonna, going to uh, address this next year with the meetings prior. So appreciate the comment. It's, it's a really valuable one and, and one that I think will help us uh, in next year's, but it, I think there are going to be some uh, some situations where funding is coming up to prepare for that, beginning to get in the in in the public view projects that are just kind of being you know possibilities, and uh, so I uh, just wanted to address that. Uh, and thank you for bringing it up. The other question related to that was about time horizon. Uh, I mean, it's a five-year plan. I think it's it's clearly. Uh, reasonable to include things that go beyond five years because that then can be the basis for the next iteration. And um, but you know, the, I, I saw, for example, on the fire stations, there's it looks like a plan for the next three fire stations in addition to the ones we've already been working on now. And so maybe one or two of those is no longer relevant to be in here because we're funded up to the next till 2035 with all we're going to be able to do in terms of those facilities. So, and that's the only example I saw. There may be some others where. You know, you could say, okay, well, there's no way we're going to get to this in the next 15 years. So let's just take it off, keep it within planning documents, but but not this particular planning document. Um, and there may be other examples. That's the one I thought of because we talked so much about fire sales tax and its renewal uh, on that one. And then I would I'd ask that maybe the city manager or or, or uh, deputy city manager talk about the city hall uh, situation a little bit. I mean, I don't think we've had clear guidance from the council either way we're going and it looks like the document has both options both uh, fixing the current facility also a new purpose-built structure um, but there may be intermediate solutions too you know as uh, uh, Joe mentioned there there'll be more room here but not enough but are there ways given that there will no longer be quite as much public um, use of this facility with the court leaving is there a way we could reconfigure or add on to this structure in a way that could preserve a, a treasure 80 year old building while providing better workspace and perhaps at a smaller check size than 11 or 12 million? So not that you have to answer it now, but those are kind of the questions I had uh, at the at the second pass at this. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I will just say that uh, City Hall is an emerging uh, thing that we really haven't uh, we have looked at the needs here, and, and some of those are in here as far as elevator, um, uh, HVAC, those types of things. But the, but I know that uh, Molly and her group have looked a little bit further at, at possible uh, funding scenarios and, and had inter introduced the possible uh, safe room or, uh, or type of strategy. That's correct. We know that there is additional funding opportunities when you add some of those components into a facility. And so... Again, just trying to find an innovative solution to funding a new facility that was um, included in this current version of the CIP. Again, just kind of keeping all of our options open and looking at all available funding sources. However, we do not have um, any plan moving forward at this time. Just looking at all available options. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Alex? Um, I would like to hear from 
the fire chief on the SCBAs. So they're listed in contingent. We elaborate on that. It also uh, says they've reached the end of their useful life. I would think that that would make them an immediate need. The reason they're in the contingent is we have applied for a grant. Okay. To cover that, um, if we get the grant, we need ten percent match. Um, if we don't get the grant, then we are going to need four hundred at some point. Uh, last year we applied for the grant and did not get that grant, and then this year we, we did apply. So at some point, if we don't get uh, the grant funding, then it's, it's going to become a very uh, critical need. And how much time do you expect that we have? Okay. Anybody else? Do we have a funding no. source for the match listed in the CIP? Because <clears throat> we have the whole amount listed as contingent, but we know that we're going to have to pay a minimum. Correct. I don't think the CIP, I think that would be because 10% of all below the Yeah, we would we would use uh, probably use one time uh, general revenue funds that we that we would have out of the either out of the, uh, several sources we can we can bring them from if if nothing else uh, if we can get a grant you know those are those are golden so we'll, we'll do whatever it takes if we have to take it out of our fund balance. I would like to see us allocate the portion that we know we're going to have to spend. And even if we don't spend it next year, we may have to cover the other 90%. So the 10% is over the $50,000 threshold that would put it in the CIP with it being $55,500. I think it'd be most appropriate to look at that during uh, our budget discussion. John, is John here? Yes, stepped out. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Question was about matching funds for the um, uh, CBAs, um, breathing devices. I can't remember CBDs or uh, what the air packs. And um, uh, Councilman Zuru was saying uh, perhaps we should appropriate that uh, in the CIP, the the match portion. And I said that I thought I thought that it would be more appropriate to appropriate that during the budget. Uh, because it would come out of the general revenue of the budget, and so we could appropriate at that time would be better while we're doing those decisions. Follow-up question to that. I mean, it, it, you kind of addressed this already, Chief, but is it, are you are you concerned about the condition of these now, or do you think we have a year or two more where you there's still safe apparatus to work with? Um, our name is the year that passes, uh, we're getting closer. Actually, we could not replace them up until two years ago. Uh, well, for the grant fund, because mm. to qualify for grant funding, they had to be 10 years old. So, and it is a significant cost. So, we waited until we got to the 10 year old mark. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the use that they get in our department is, is fairly heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, we you know, have to say we're getting very close to the end of the life expectancy of them. Um, we're really relying on the grant, uh, but then if we don't get the grant this year, then we're going to really seriously have to look at next year. Will we soon be in a position where parts will be a challenge to get, or we? Is it more the, the amount of time put into maintenance? It's not a challenge to get the parts right now. We're still making them this year. We're having to buy more parts because of the breakdown. And the time on the for the mechanics efforts. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, Alex. It's at this uh, time that we ask for anybody who is here to appear on items that are not on the agenda. Do we have anyone in the audience that wishes to speak to anything that's not on the agenda tonight? Good evening. Good evening. My name is uh, Ron North. I'm the uh, vice president of your local NAACP. And I'm um, coming up in February, we have our Freedom Fund Banquet. 
on February 25th. It's going to be a night of elegance and music and good food. So we'd like to, I came to cordially invite you all out. Um, really, really, really need your um, joining in and partnering with us in this. And um, also, as the NAACP, one of the leaders of the NAACP, I just wanted to say that we are here for you guys. Um, you know, we're not just here for our little stuff that we got going on. So please feel free to reach out to me or any member of the NAACP if you need help with anything. It doesn't even matter what it is. You know, we're we're here for you. All right. What's we're, that date again, Mr. North? February 25th, Saturday, February 25th. It's going to be at Ray's. Um, we have some cards back here that we'll probably leave laying around. Um, and also you can get Miss Moore up here. We'll probably have some information with her, too. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to appear on items not on the agenda? Yes, sir. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Carl Armstrong. I live out on Silver Springs Road, about a half mile north of Central High School. And I wanted to talk briefly about an opportunity that will be coming up later this year or possibly next year regarding historical preservation. Uh, as you well know, uh, we kind of stand on the shoulders of people like Lorma, uh, Hauk, Ramsey, Gibbony, and uh, a lot of others that uh, have worked to found this city. And uh, anyway, uh, in 1797, there was a family that came to the area. They were of the Ramsey family, Alhousie Castle in Scotland. And uh, Rebecca Ramsey married an Alexander Gibbony. And fast forwarding a little bit, uh, eventually their granddaughter married Lewis Houck. And I'm sure each of you know of uh, the contributions of Lewis Houck to the city, uh, the railroads, uh, Houck Stadium, he was instrumental in founding the Normal uh, College in 1873. And uh, anyway, it does appear that Elmwood might be available uh, for the city and possibly some other agencies combined later this year or next year to have an opportunity for historical preservation. And if I may, I'd like to uh, give each of you a book that outlines this. I know you're busy. I don't want to take a lot of your time. But if I may, I'd like to do that. <laughs> and anyway, Elmwood is uh, modeled after Dalhousie Castle in Scotland. And uh, Dalhousie's uh, castle in Scotland has a long history going back a thousand years. So this book uh, details the history going all the way back about a thousand years and how the Ramsey family, it talks about the Hauk family, Louis Lormier, as the French would say, and how they all came to this area. And uh, 
the synergistics of it uh, resulted in where we we're sitting mm -hmm. here today. Uh, the book gives colored pictures of the inside of Elmwood Manor for those that haven't been there. And it details the history. My interest in this is that uh, I live in a 1795 log cabin that was built by the brother of Rebecca Ramsey. And it still exists out on Silver Springs Road. And we really haven't asked for a lot of publicity for the book yet. Uh, it's, it's kind of been a pre-publicity release, but I wanted to give a heads up to the city council. And when the opportunity comes along for the city, the county, maybe the state, maybe the university to combine together to preserve Elmwood, uh, I think it would be a great thing for Cape, uh, for the tourist. Uh, obviously, we have the wall, we have the red house, and we have a lot of other things that bring people to Cape. And I think this would be a great tourist attraction. So this is my short spiel. Did anybody have any questions? Questions from council? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. No. Thank you. It's an incredible book, and um, I learned a whole lot. I didn't know. Thank you. I think I, in, uh, having already looked at the book, uh, I think that it's a uh, kind of self-explanatory about the value of this as a historical uh, place in our community. So thank you for pres uh, presenting that, sir. Anybody else in the audience who uh, wishes to speak on any items not on the agenda? Anybody else? All right. Uh, then we'll proceed to the agenda review. Okay. Council, uh, we have... Uh, no, uh, excuse me, we have one presentation tonight uh, for Mr. Robert Harris. Um, it will be an exciting time. Robert is a, a, a treasure to our community and to recognize his service uh, will be uh, not only well deserved, but uh, a, a very good uh, time. So we look forward to that. Uh, communications and reports. Uh, Council, do you have items you would like to report during this time? Anybody? Yeah. Uh, I'll mention the uh, Martin Luther King breakfast that the mayor and I attended, as well as the uh, the celebration dinner uh, that same also last week. Good. Others? Yeah. We will. Uh, uh, we have no public hearings tonight, and then we will have our appearances of items that are on the agenda. Um, and then we have the consent agenda. The uh, item number two will be the second and third reading of the Board of Examiners, repealing the Board of Examiners and enacting new sections in order to uh, make that a staff function. Uh, number three will be uh, uh, vacating the unimproved uh, Sunset Boulevard right away north of Merriweather. Uh, number four is the record plat for Lil Mac uh, East Subdivision out off of uh, um, this. LaSalle, thank you. Um, number five will be the release of the lien for uh, 1324 Monticello for the Neighborhood Stabilization Grant. Uh, uh, and then uh, number six will be the existing of uh, the, pop the public improvements out at the new convention center. Are there any of these items you'd like to remove from the consent agenda or abstain or note? If not, of new ordinances. The new ordinance is, uh, number seven is the uh, first reading of the uh, ordinance relating to chickens and the city limits and other animal regulations. Um, if you look at the reports, uh, we have a report from Development Services and uh, I noted that and uh, then also from the uh, uh, Chief of Police. Uh, do you have any other questions regarding uh, this proposed ordinance? Scott, I just had one um, on number 12 of the memo from uh, Ryan to Alex. It says, if any part of the ordinance, did I miss anything? Was there anything 
within the recommendations that staff made that would um, trigger it. Would number seven in that trigger that to go to the zone? Yeah, I um, there are, no, we are not doing anything that would require this to go to planning and zoning. Okay. You, were, you needed an exception from a setback requirement or something like that, but there is nothing within the actual chicken ordinance itself that would require you to go to planning and zoning. Right, that was all I, was, I, uh, all I had a question. The, uh, uh, if I remember right, the chicken houses are considered a, an accessory uh, structure. So if they would exceed the dimensions of an allowed accessory start structure, then they would have to go and get a variance. That would not. That, that, that is would, correct. Each property is allowed to have one accessory structure and a minor accessory structure. And if someone, by wanting to have the, the uh, a, a chicken coop of one fashion or another, was going to exceed the uh, number of accessory structures that, that are allowed at that property, then they would have to have a variance to allow that additional accessory structure. Um, other questions? Dot uh, number eight is uh, we talked about uh, earlier uh, from planning and zoning about uh, the uh, second uh, Humphrey Second subdivision. This is uh, a large, large uh, lot that is being broken up into two lots, and I assume sell one of them. Uh, number nine is the record plat for Rock Gardens subdivision. That's off of LaSalle as well. Uh, number 10 is uh, authorizes the mayor to ex execute a special warranty deed to Drury Development Corporation uh, for land out at the uh, Greater Cape uh, Business Park. And number 11 uh, is um, establishes stop signs in, uh, off of Williamsburg Drive. This is uh, Brandon Williams uh, subdivision out there off of uh, Perryville. Any further questions on those? There are no appointments tonight, and uh, that's the entire agenda. All right. That will conclude our study session. Uh, I need a no closed session? Yeah. There's no closed session tonight needed. So we will reconvene at 7 o'clock in this room. Thank you. Don't worry, I'll beat him up if anybody tries to sit there. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.